Of all the biblical genres, the letters of the New Testament is probably the one most frequently preached. That is not surprising since it is the nearest to our own time chronologically and the one with which we feel most comfortable, both in substance and in style. With three quarters of the New Testament written in this genre, it was clearly selected by the Holy Spirit, governing and inspiring the apostles as the most appropriate channel for the completion of the biblical revelation. But why? With the inauguration of the new covenant in Christ, the identity and focus of the people of God moved from ethnic Israel to the universal church. And from its beginning, the church was composed of a wide ethnic diversity and increasingly located in equally varied geographical contexts across the Roman Empire. Wherever the gospel spread, churches were planted, many of which would never have received a visit from an apostle. Oral proclamation was still at the heart of evangelism, but written documents carrying apostolic authenticity became increasingly important as the years passed, hence the Gospels and the letters. The format of the epistles is broadly typical of first century letter writing style. They begin with the identity of the sender, the recipients, and a greeting. Then follows a thanksgiving, which often highlights the central theme of the letter. The main body of the letter unpacks the themes further in terms of instruction, exhortation, requests and warnings, before ending with practical applications and personal greetings. This reminds us that the letter creates, or more often develops, a strong personal relationship between the writer and his readers. This personal bond is very similar to that between a preacher and his hearers today, so that the letters provide us not only with instructional content for our preaching, but also with a methodology as well. Even the letters addressed to individuals contain indications that they were to be read to the churches, and all the rest were clearly designed to be read aloud in the congregations. Since the pronoun you is almost always plural, many of Paul's letters indicate that they were dictated to a writer, so that the verbal element is always strong and the sentences often long. Establishing the theme tune of the book is especially important for expounding the letters. They are best preached sequentially, section by section, which means that we shall need to have a firm grasp on why the letter was written, the issues that are being addressed, and especially the remedies being proposed. Otherwise, we shall be tempted to extract a verse or a paragraph to preach on as though it was not rooted in its context, both literary and theological. That will deprive it of its original purpose and its applicatory power. So it is important to remember that the letters are not a collage of doctrinal teaching and ethical instruction. They are real letters written to real people in real churches facing real issues. The authors do not set out to write an academic doctrinal thesis, but to teach truth in order to undermine error and to apply that truth to the practical issues of church life and behavior, which are challenging the health and welfare of the congregations. Our challenge is to use our tools to get to the meat of each section. Careful analysis of the text is an essential ingredient in our exposition of the letters. Vocabulary is enormously important. The repetition of key words or phrases will often highlight the major themes or issues with which the writer is concerned. Fullness in Colossians, suffering in 1 Peter, love in 1 John, the heavenlies in Ephesians. But we do need to give time to understand as accurately as we can what these terms mean, not primarily in a lexicon or dictionary, but as they are used in the context of the book itself. Bible words have Bible meanings. That is why the words are lifeless until we see them operating in their contexts, both immediate and in the book as a whole. This means that the structure of the sentences which comprise the paragraphs 
or thought sections of the letter, has a very important part to play. To undertake a sentence analysis is often the most helpful way to see the emphasis and significance of what's being said. The longer the sentence, the more helpful it will be. Let's take as an example a long sentence of four verses, which is Titus 3, 4 to 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us for righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Every sentence, however long, has a main verb. It stands on its own as the big idea, and all the other ideas depend on it. We need to identify that first, and it is not hard to find at the start of verse 5, he saved us. That is what the sentence is about, and all the other clauses based on subsidiary verbs are attached to it. So our task is to separate them out and identify how they relate to he saved us. Go through in sequence. Verse 4 begins when, and that is what it contributes to the whole. When did God save us? When Jesus the Saviour appeared in the world as the incarnation of God's goodness and loving kindness. Verse 5 introduces a not but construction which clarifies why he saved us. We did nothing to deserve it. We are entirely dependent on God's mercy. Then the verse moves on to show how he saved us, through the cleansing power of the new birth brought about by the Holy Spirit, with verse 6 reminding us that this generous, overflowing gift is the fruit of Christ's saving work. The last part of the sentence, verse 7, explains to what end he saved us. Present justification and future glory. Through this sentence analysis, the sermon structure has now clearly appeared and the outline has almost begun to write itself. So do spend time on working out the flow of the sentences in the letters. It will deepen your understanding and sharpen your own presentation. All this makes the letters supremely relevant to us as pastor teachers today. They start where the people are, uncovering the hidden roots of the issues facing the churches, explaining where the snares and dangers lie, but they are never problem-centered. Rather, they proclaim Christ, who is the gospel, into the situation and reveal how his person and work are ultimately the remedy for every error and weakness and the only sure road to spiritual maturity. We can illustrate this from the most well-known passage concerning the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. Almost every denomination incorporates this foundational material into their order for the communion service. The passage gives the historical background and the significance of the event as taught by Jesus himself. This is my body, which is for you, verse 24. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, verse 24. But the teaching is not set out as a doctrinal formulation, so much as a corrective to what was going on and going wrong in Corinth. There are divisions and factions, at the supper, some have nothing to eat, while others get drunk. Greed and self-seeking predominate, so that the Lord and his self-giving love are profaned by those who eat and drink without discernment and will therefore incur judgment. The teaching is there, clear and plain, but given not for its own sake, but to correct a grievous distortion. There are multiple examples. The great Christological passage that is Colossians 1, 15 to 20 does not exist in a vacuum. It is a wonderful statement of the supremacy of Christ over all things in creation and the new creation, 
but its purpose is to correct the Colossians, who are being tempted to look for something in addition to Christ, some extra fullness beyond the Lord Jesus, and teach them that they are pursuing a figment of their own imagination. In Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells, 2.9. And what could be richer than that? Or take the great exposition of the gospel in Titus 2, 11 to 14, which is set in the context of what has to be taught to the church so that lives of godliness will commend Christ and the gospel. In a context where people are turning away from the truth, 1, 14, and demonstrating characteristics of their old sinful lives rather than the transforming power of Christ, the urgent problem prompts the doctrinal exposition. There are important clues here for our own preaching of the letters, since we stand in the gospel succession from the apostles. Their primary appeal is always to the mind. They want to increase their hearers' perception of what Paul calls in Romans 11.33, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. The way they teach is by constantly sowing the seed of who Christ is, what he has accomplished, and the personal and pastoral implications of faith in him. The sentences of the letters are carefully constructed to pursue the logical development of a particular line of thought and to bring it to its conclusion and point out its application, especially for the presenting issues which prompted the letter to be written. They do not play upon the emotions, nor are they interested in intellectual cleverness, As they teach the churches, their motivation is precisely the same as in their initial presentation of the gospel. They call their readers to a life of repentance, faith, and obedience on the basis of God's self-revelation in all the scriptures, but supremely in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Learning Christ is how Paul describes their own conversion to the Ephesians, 4 verse 20. They were taught the truth as it is in Jesus, which was to put off their old selves and to be renewed in the spirit of their minds, 4.23. Spiritual renewal depends on a mind that receives God's revealed truth. It is not just a warm but quickly passing feeling. When we read the book of Acts and find the apostolic evangelists at work, The verb that is frequently used is to persuade. There is not a different methodology post-conversion. It is the same model or method for the nurture and growth of all disciples. We can represent it by a series of questions which we might imagine the apostles asking because of how they structure so much of what they write in their letters. One, do you see what your present difficulties are? Two, do you realize what are their root causes beneath the surface? Three, do you understand who Jesus is and what he has done for you? Four, do you see how that addresses your problems? Five, are you willing to act on the implications of this in life-changing ways? The apostolic letters are bridges built by their inspired authors to link the revealed truth of God with the reality of life issues being faced by the churches. They appeal to mind, heart, and will, but are just as much connected to the real-life situations of their readers as they are rooted in the truth and its implications which they are declaring. We shall not preach the letters accurately and effectively if our sermons do not have the same purpose and follow the same trajectory. We too are bridge builders. That was the calling of the Old Testament prophets to come as God's covenant enforcement mediators to build a bridge from the Torah into the life experience of their contemporaries. That was the apostolic calling in proclaiming Christ as the only bridge between God and man. And that is the work of the New Testament letters, to connect people where they are with the life-transforming truth of God, to urge and persuade, to encourage and rebuke, but always to exalt Christ. And that is our calling too. Expository preaching is bridge building. 
This means that our task of primary importance is, of course, to exegete the text. But it is pointless if when we get the text right, we do not also get it across to our hearers. And in order to do that, we have to also exegete our hearers, our congregation. People are crying out for relevance in the preaching they hear, and the letters are overflowing with it, but all too often their exposition in preaching belongs more to the world of the academic seminar than to the heart desires and heart aches of the listeners. Start where your people are. Show them why and how the text addresses their situation, both as a church family and as individuals. Work out the parallels between what the first century churches faced and our situation today. The clothing and presentation may be different, but underneath at root, the issues are still the same. So preach this great resource of the letters in all their rich variety, not as detached doctrine, but as they really are, the living and enduring word of God. <laughs>